two murders are linked by unusual bullets. But linking them to the killers seems like a shot in the dark. A woman points the finger of blame at her killers. But catching them depends on a forensic technique that hasn't been invented yet. When detectives on the trail of cattle rustlers uncover what looks like serial murder, they call on forensics to help them round up their suspects. They say that a burden shared is a burden halved. But when partners team up for murder, the weight of their crime can drag them both down. The burden of proof is on forensics to capture partners in crime. November 19, 1989, around 11.30 p.m. On the mean streets of Trenton, New Jersey, a passerby discovered a brutal murder. The victim was 38-year-old Francis C. Bodner, a driver for Golden Cabs. All right, lab tech over here, please. Officers at the scene examined the victim's body and combed the taxi for clues. Along with the slugs, they recovered a small metal disc with a raised edge, almost like a miniature bottle cap. It was a puzzling find. Detective Lieutenant Michael Salvatore felt it held the key to solving this crime. Right, Carmen, tell me about that case from last night. Because no one had ever seen that type of bullet before, that there was a possibility that the bullet had been um, uh, created by a, uh, uh, an enthusiast, someone who loads their own bullets at home. Hey, gentlemen. If that were true, the bullets would be almost impossible to trace. But Salvatore hadn't seen the last of them. Just four hours later, he was called to another murder scene. A second taxicab driver was shot dead. Willie Rogers, age 33, had been discovered in the taxi he drove for the Diamond Cab Company. What do we got, guys? Again, investigators recovered the same odd metal disc along with a spent bullet. There she is. That's what we've been looking and in both cases, witnesses reported seeing three black men in the taxi prior to the murder. The evidence technicians soon produced another clue, a fingerprint lifted from the first taxi's front passenger side door. The Trenton Police Department's evidence lab transmitted the print to the National Fingerprint Database, a clearinghouse for fingerprint evidence from around the country. It would take some time before the results came back and there was no guarantee the print on the cab belonged to the killer. The Mercer County Medical Examiner performed the autopsies later that day. Bodner and Rogers were both killed by a single shot to the back of the head, execution style. The executioners left behind little besides the unusual bullets. To solve the execution-style murders, Trenton police had to rely on ballistic evidence taken from the crime scene. It's all they had. By 11 o'clock on the morning the drivers were killed, Trenton police had delivered the bullets to the New Jersey State Police Lab's Captain Mike Lysinger. The bullets perplexed him as much as they did Detective Salvatore, and Lysinger had been a ballistics expert for more than 20 years. His reference books showed that the little metal cap was called a gas check. The gas check is very unusual because you never see this in commercial ammunition. This is the first time we've ever encountered a gas check 
as long as I've been in ballistics. This was something unique to us. A gas check is placed on the base of the bullet to keep it from melting and clogging the gun barrel with lead. Many people who make their own bullets use gas checks. But Lysinger could tell these bullets were commercially manufactured, though no American company made them. Now, he had to determine what sort of gun fired them. Using the lab's stereo microscope, he identified the pattern of alternating grooves and the spaces between the grooves, or lands, left on the bullets as they sped through the gun barrel. These lands and grooves are a gun's class characteristics, and ballistics experts can use them to identify the type of weapon most likely to have left them on a bullet. Lysinger determined that the Trenton gas check bullets had a pattern of five lands and grooves with a twist to the right. He told Salvatore to look for a Taurus revolver, a Ruger revolver, or a Smith & Wesson. All of these were in common use among Trenton criminals. Any one of thousands of weapons could have left its mark on the bullets. Investigators didn't even know where to start looking. Before long, however, they got their first lead. In the early morning of November 27th, an anonymous caller told Trenton police that two of the gunmen were twins named Ron and John Allen. Later that same day, John Allen was picked up for smashing car windows during a street fight. Investigators had him brought up for an interview. John Allen said he had been with his twin Ron and their friend all evening the night the cabbies were killed. They had hung out at a couple of clubs until 3 a.m. Salvatore wasn't convinced, but without physical evidence tying John Allen to the killings, he had nothing. When John Allen's prints didn't match the one pulled from the taxi, detectives wondered about his brother. They pulled Ron Allen's prints from a previous arrest record. Trenton police compared Ron Allen's file print against the one left on the taxi. The point-by-point -point comparison was a match. Ron Allen had been in the murdered man's vehicle. That wasn't enough to prove he was the murderer. Taxis see dozens of fares each day, but the match told investigators they were on the right track. Hey, what's up, man? Police learned that the Allen hey, brothers were Trenton locals who became involved with a rough and dangerous gang called the New York Boys. Turf was at a premium in the Big Apple, so the gangs there started colonizing New Jersey. The Allens were recruited. I mean, Chief Williams knew all Detectives about. continued to interview friends and enemies of the Allen brothers, and hoping to poke holes that. in their alibi, hoping for anything they could all right. use. Um, can, all right, can, on the street, just about everybody knew what was going on, but uh, unfortunately, in uh, a lot of the homicide cases I've worked on, uh, people are very reluctant to come forward and give, uh, give that information up. The information they gathered continued to implicate the Allen brothers, but stopped short of being enough to arrest them. Then, on the evening of December 20th, 1989, one courageous eyewitness stepped forward. When police assured him that he'd be safe, he agreed to talk. He told police that he was parked directly behind the first victim's taxi during the crime. He saw Bodner shot from behind and heard the window shatter. Then he drove past the cab, fast, and saw three men going through Bodner's pockets. He identified Ron and John Allen as two of the three men he had seen in the cab that night. The dragnet was closing in on the Allen brothers, but a single fingerprint and a rushed eyewitness account might not be strong enough to win the maximum sentence for these alleged killers. 
detectives still needed to find a way to use the killer's ammunition against them. That's what I'm talking about right here. Mm -hmm. The investigation into the gang-style murder of two Trenton taxi drivers was making slow progress. Police had a witness who could place the Allen brothers at the scene of one driver's murder. Now they had to place a gun in their hands. They got help from a police informant. Mm -hmm. but what do you got for me? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You interested? He yeah. told police that the Allens something? had tried to sell him guns and ammunition oh, several weeks that. back, and that the no, guns man. had two Why? bodies on them, right. two murders. Yo, let me think about that. Yo. I just he didn't buy them. All right. Think about it, right? All right. All right. Think to prove the Allens' involvement, Detective Salvatore needed those guns. He sent the informant yeah, out to get them. There. The informant risked his life to do so. He's on vacation today? Within two days, uh, we received a phone call from the informant, and uh, he had the weapons. He turned over the two revolvers and a fistful of bullets that he had Definitely just purchased from the Allens. Our cabbies. We also have Salvatore sent the guns to the ballistics lab to compare with the slugs recovered from the taxis. It's the same class Both guns had five lands and grooves with a right-hand twist. Both could have fired the bullets found at the crime scenes. Another test would determine if one of them actually had. The guns were test fired. The marks on the test fired slugs from one of the guns matched the fatal slugs. Investigators had found the weapon they were looking for the gun that killed Francis Bodner and Willie Rogers. Police obtained the warrants they needed to arrest the Allens. Officers swarmed over the places where they usually hung out. They found John Allen and brought him in. Ron Allen called Detective Salvatore a few hours later, asking about his twin. Detectives had the call traced. While I was uh, talking to Ron on the phone, we had a couple teams out here in West Trenton, a couple detective teams poised in various locations out here because we knew this is where they, they uh, frequented and where he probably was. And as soon as we got the information from the, uh, the Bell operator, we fed that information to our, uh, our units on the street and they uh, came here and they forced their way into the house and arrested Ron Allen, who was still on the phone with me at the time of the arrest. Tell me your story one more time. At first, Ron Allen denied everything. Then, no. investigators listed the evidence against him. Right. Tell me what Allen gave it up for him, for his twin, and for a third man. Allen said on the night of the murder, he and his twin were out with a man named Greg Williams. He claimed Williams pulled the trigger. By 7 that evening, an arrest warrant had been issued for Williams. Five days later, authorities arrested him in Osceola, Georgia. But Salvatore was never convinced for a minute that Williams had been the trigger man. The weapon used in the murder of the two taxi drivers were guns owned by the Allen brothers. They were guns carried by the Allen brothers. They were guns held by the Allen brothers. So it was um, not likely that Gregory Williams possessed the gun and killed the cab drivers. We believe that it was the Allen brothers who killed them. On July 10th, 1990, Ronald and John Allen were convicted of the taxicab murders. On August 16th, they were sentenced to two consecutive life terms. The Allen twins will be over 100 years old when they become eligible for parole. For his part in the crime, Greg Williams was sentenced to life as well. The Allen twins and Greg Williams killed two men for just over $100. Money they intended to spend in New York City to buy drugs they could peddle in Trenton. In jail, the Allens bragged about robbing and killing the taxi drivers, saying they were easy targets. 
With ballistics evidence, so were the Allens. The Allen brothers found their victims on the streets. But staying at home doesn't necessarily mean staying safe. Los Angeles, April 17th, 1991. On this morning, Marilyn Rush knew something was wrong when her friend Joan Dolly didn't show up for work. Joan was never late, and she wasn't answering her phone. Concerned, Marilyn drove to the house Joan shared with her husband, Dennis, to make sure she was all right. Even though Joan's car wasn't in the driveway, Marilyn went inside to check on her friend. She found her in the bedroom. Joan? 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 Oh, God. God. When the LAPD responded to the crime scene, it looked at first glance like a botched burglary. The bedroom had been ransacked. Joan Dolly's bruised hands told investigators that she had tried to defend herself. The Dolly's neighborhood had had a rash of break-ins, and this one matched the pattern. Outside, a screen had been removed from an open window, and a ladder stood beneath it. But as police worked the scene, they began to compile a growing list of clues that didn't fit with the burglary scenario. The damp ground under the window had no footprints or marks from the ladder. The windowsill, where the burglars allegedly climbed in, was clean of any dirt or scuff marks. And a hundred dollars was left in plain sight on the kitchen counter. It appeared as if someone had worked hard to make it look like Joan Dolly had interrupted a burglary. LAPD detective Paul Tippin wasn't convinced. All of these things together with the evidence at the supposedly the point of entry didn't add up. Initially, of course, you look at it as a burglary murder, but uh, uh, as it progressed, it turned out to be a fabricated crime scene, basically. Police suspected the murderer had contrived the scene after killing Dolly. Officers notified the victim's husband, Dennis Dolly, and asked him some routine questions. If you have that type of a murder, you're going to have to eliminate the uh, spouse. Well, you have to get over that hurdle before you can go to the next step. Dennis told police that he and Joan were high school sweethearts, married 35 years. He'd last spoken to his wife the night before. She was still asleep when he left the house at a quarter to five that morning for his job at the golf course. He had no idea what could have happened or who could have wanted his wife dead. He said he couldn't bear to stay in the house. If police had more questions, they could reach him at the home of his daughter, Debbie Myers. With Dennis Dolly above suspicion, Tippin pressed forward in his search for clues to this hideous murder. Now take that bag. The autopsy found that the victim had been killed by blunt force trauma to the back of her head. Tests turned up no evidence of sexual assault. The coroner discovered traces of blood and foreign matter under the victim's fingernails. But investigators had no certain way of telling whether it was the killers or the victims. In these early days of DNA technology, Accurate testing required large samples. Testing the traces of material from under the victim's nails would jeopardize the sole piece of potential evidence. My first question was, do you think we can get DNA evidence from any evidence under her nails? And the answer was yes, but once we do it, then we may destroy all of the evidence through the analysis. So 
I was real reluctant at that time to do it. The risk was too great. Tippin would have to rely on old-fashioned detective work to solve this one, at least for now. Four days after the murder, Joan Dolly's missing car reappeared. Her son-in-law spotted it in a parking lot across the street from the card store where Joan had worked. Police found her keys, but no useful clues. Two days after the victim's funeral, Detective Tippin called Dolly at his daughter's house to see if he had noticed anything else the burglars may have taken. All right, see you when I get back. But okay. Debbie Myers told Tippin that her father was gone. Dolly said that he needed to get away. He planned to spend a few days quietly fishing at Lake Mead. Myers told Tippin the name of the Las Vegas hotel where her father usually stayed. Tippin's experience told him it was strange for a man to leave town so soon after his wife's murder. He asked a pal in the Las Vegas Metro Police Department to keep an eye on Dolly. Tippin's Hello. opinion of the bereaved husband was about to change. The Joan Dolly murder investigation took a strange turn when Dennis Dolly turned up in a Vegas casino at 3.30 in the morning. He was in the company of a woman. Detective Tippin received surveillance photos of the pair. After checking around, the woman was identified as Brandita Taliano. The news didn't sit well. After I determined that he was in Las Vegas uh, with a female, um, Two days after he had buried his uh, wife of 35 years, uh, I became very suspicious. Tippin looked into Taliano's background. He found that her rap sheet included convictions for prostitution and drugs. She had no fixed address. He also discovered that Taliano had been staying in the Mission Hills Motel in LA during the time of Joan Dolly's murder. The motel was just a quarter mile down the road from where Joan's car had been recovered. This was worth a closer look. So I went to uh, uh, the Mission Hills Motel, uh, talked with the manager, and basically what happened was he gave me a list of phone calls and phone numbers going back a month. Tippin checked the list of Taliano's outgoing calls. She had phoned Dolly's home, the golf complex where he worked, and a local bowling alley that was his favorite hangout. Police Department, Miss Taliano? It was time to pay a call on Taliano. He traced her to a North Hollywood motel. Yes, ma'am, a detective Tibbin from the police department. I have a Detectives approached Taliano and asked to search her room. Surprisingly, she agreed without blinking an eye. Generally speaking, I mean, if someone is that cooperative, they're not thinking that uh, they have anything that may develop into a lead or lead you to believe that they were involved in a homicide. The search turned up several pieces of jewelry. Most of it was junk. But one piece looked particularly valuable and not the kind of jewelry Taliano would normally own. Taliano had an explanation ready. She told them that she was often hired to clean the Dolly's house. While she was there, she took some jewelry, but not entirely without Dennis's knowledge. They were having an affair. She wanted us to believe that basically she was okay with being around Joan Dolly and Dennis. But Joan didn't know that the sexual activity was taking place. Detective Detectives found a note stating that Dennis was nervous about Taliano keeping the jewelry. He wanted her to fence it. That suggested he was involved in its theft. It's a very nice piece of jewelry here. 
A few days later, Debbie Myers identified the jewelry. She recognized the piece that her mother always wore. If that were true, then Taliano couldn't have stolen it from the victim's jewelry box. The other side. Jones' jewelry in Taliano's possession and a note linking Dolly to the stolen pieces. Too many coincidences were piling up too quickly. Perhaps their secret game didn't stop at theft. Once I identified uh, Brandita Taliano and the things that were going on uh, with her and Dennis Dolly, it became more and more apparent that it was a conspiracy and uh, that these two people were involved in the case. Investigators began to believe that Joan Dolly's murder was a crime motivated by love. Not Dennis and Brandita's love for each other, but their mutual adoration for money. If Dennis divorced his wife, he'd lose half of everything he owned. Plus, Joan had recently inherited close to $100,000. Police suspected that Dennis Dolly was a shifty and dangerous man. If he and Brandita had plotted to kill Joan because Dolly wanted all of her money, then why would he want to share it with Brandita? I was somewhat concerned about Brandita also in her situation because I thought the possibility was there that Dennis would murder Brandita just to get her out of the way. The evidence against the pair was only circumstantial. Investigators had no physical evidence putting them at the murder scene on the morning of April 17th. But they had enough to bring them in for questioning. At least then, authorities could keep their eyes on the pair. Based on what they had gathered so far, detectives developed a strategy. They had 48 hours to either charge them or let them go. It was a calculated risk. Tippin knew he didn't have the evidence to charge them. So he was gambling that once in custody, they'd crack and turn on each other. Dennis admitted to meeting Brandi Italiano on the street. And uh, basically that's all he would admit to was, yes, he was wrong and connecting up with Brandita and having her as a girlfriend, but as far as the murder or anything else, he was not involved in anything. Taliano told a different story. Hi, Miss Taliano, how are you today? A few months before Joan's murder, Taliano had been serving time in a women's prison in Los Angeles. While visiting her there, Dolly had asked her a favor. Did she know anyone he could hire for a big job? She assumed that meant murdering his wife. Taliano recommended a man named Gary Ware. Dolly's deal with Ware must have been finalized while Taliano was in prison. She said Dolly never told her what happened. It was a hot lead. But investigators would need a lot more evidence to turn it into a murder charge that would stick. And Tippin's 48 hours were up. Authorities were forced to let Dolly and Taliano go. Ware was no choir boy. A man with a criminal record like his might be capable of committing murder for hire. His phone records showed that Dolly called him prior to Joan's death, but not afterward. All of a sudden, I have him right in the middle of this homicide with phone calls that are being directed to him by Dennis Dolly. So I had to find out why those calls were being made and what his participation or involvement was. Uh, Gary Ware, how you doing? But a hardened criminal like Ware wouldn't just volunteer information yes, to the police. Uh, Tippin spent a year trying to get him to talk. With his attorney present, Ware finally admitted to authorities that Dolly had contacted him with an interesting business proposition. Yeah, yeah, I, I... 
the two agreed to meet. Dolly wanted Ware to kill his wife. He gave Ware $30,000 cash and told him he didn't care how Ware did it, but he wanted her gone. At first, Tippin couldn't understand why Ware would implicate himself in Joan Dolly's murder like this. As it turned out, he had an airtight alibi. On the morning the victim was murdered, he was in lockup at Chino State Prison. Tippin's most promising lead fizzled right before his eyes. After more than a year spent investigating Joan Dolly's murder, the case went cold. Though LAPD detectives had their suspicion, they still needed hard evidence placing Dennis Dolly and Brandita Taliano at the scene of the murder of Joan Dolly. One lead after another failed to pay off. Then, on the last day of February, 1994, Detective Paul Tippin got a call that he'd been waiting three years for. In the time since Joan Dolly's murder, DNA analysis technology had been refined enormously. A new technique allowed even a tiny pinpoint of genetic material to be analyzed. Now, the lab could accurately test only a portion of the foreign matter found under the victim's nails without the risk of ruining the entire DNA sample. The lab's new testing technology, called PCR for polymerase chain reaction, encourages the DNA to carry out its natural function, continuous duplication. A carefully controlled environment of chemicals and heat works like a genetic copying machine. Colin Yamauchi is a criminalist with the LAPD Crime Lab DNA unit. We can start with a small sample and put it in this instrument that can make hundreds and then thousands and then hundreds of thousands and millions of copies of that same DNA. So it was kind of an exciting time in forensic serology when PCR came online and we were able to utilize this technology. With PCR, an immeasurable amount of DNA can be cultivated into a testable sample. The procedure was performed on a portion of material taken from beneath Joan Dolly's fingernails, then compared with DNA from her blood. It didn't match. Someone else's cells were under Joan Dolly's nails. And that meant that the possibility of a suspect's DNA was there. And that was very, very important to me because now it, it, it brought about a, a situation where I could maybe directly connect a suspect to the victim. And that was very, very important. Dennis Dolly's genetic material was tested against the sample from his wife's nails. It came back negative. By this time, Brandita Taliano was in prison for an unrelated crime. A warrant was issued and a blood sample obtained. This time, Tippin got his match. Now there could be no doubt. Brandita Taliano murdered Joan Dolly. But Tippin still wasn't convinced that Taliano had acted alone. Dennis Dolly's knowledge of the stolen jewelry, his attempt to hire a hitman, and a long string of incriminating phone records before the crime implicated him in the murder. I believe truly that they were both in it, they were both involved in it, they were both there when it happened. The jury agreed that Dennis Dolly and Brandita Taliano had conspired and murdered Joan Dolly. Nearly four years after her death, her killers were sentenced to 25 years to life. Dolly and Taliano believed that murder was the easy way to wealth. Unfortunately, they weren't the only ones to feel that way. Some people make murder a part of their business plan. Livingston County, North Central Missouri. Over a hundred years ago, this was wild, rough country under the rule of frontier justice. 
Today, it has settled into the essence of rural America. Old style towns surrounded by farmland. A place where farmers contend with the whims of the weather and the realities of economics. People here believe in an honest wage for honest work. At least most of them believe that. In October 1986, the Livingston County Sheriff's Department received a call from a nearby livestock auction company. A man named Dennis Murphy had passed a bad check for $6,000 to buy cattle. He had paid for the cattle, loaded them into a truck, and vanished. Though Murphy was a stranger, he appeared to be working with a local farmer named Ray Copeland. Ray had attended the auction, and while he hadn't bought any livestock, he provided a truck for the cattle Murphy had bought. Sheriff Gary Calvert paid Mr. Copeland a visit to find out more about Murphy. He admitted that he knew Dennis Murphy, that uh, Dennis had rented his pasture to keep those cows, and that he in fact had uh, sold some cows to Dennis himself and that Dennis had gave, gave him a bad check also. It might have been the end of the story, except that a month later, Calvert received another call about a drifter passing bad checks for about $6,000 worth of livestock. The drifter resold the cows, took the cash, and disappeared. Again, Ray Copeland had been at the auction, and it was his truck that carted the cattle away. But once again, Copeland said he was a victim too. While that may have been true, Calvert had reasons for doubt. Ray Copeland had been arrested several times for passing bad checks of his own. Still, Calvert had no proof that he was behind this. Both of the cattle thieves had arrest records, consistently bouncing in and out of jail on minor charges. Calvert assumed they were bound to get arrested again. He'd catch up with them soon enough. All he had to do was wait. Two years passed without any more trouble. Then, in October 1988, Calvert learned about three more drifters passing bad paper for good cattle. This wasn't the kind of crime Calvert had seen a lot of. Now he'd seen five cases in 24 months. They had to be related. When Calvert ran a check on the two men who'd stolen the cows two years earlier, he found no record of them. They hadn't been arrested again anywhere. Calvert couldn't believe that these small-time criminals had reformed into model citizens. But he didn't know where they had gone or if Copeland might truly be involved. Calvert had heard rumors, though. Copeland's neighbors told him that he was hiring drifters from the local mission to help him at cattle auctions because he couldn't hear well anymore. Copeland supposedly promised to pay the men $50 a day to stay on his farm and not tell anyone they were there. Even if those rumors were true, they didn't mean much. A year passed before Calvert got more information and it wasn't what he expected. On August 20th, 1989, an anonymous caller to Nebraska's Crime Stoppers hotline tipped authorities to watch out for Ray and Faye Copeland of Mooresville, Missouri. The caller said that he had worked for the Copelands. Ray had made him buy cattle with bad checks and then threatened to kill him. He said he wasn't the first. He hinted that Ray was a murderer. Jack McCormick. On September 6, 1989, just two weeks after the phone tip, the anonymous caller surfaced. Jack McCormick was picked up outside Salem, Oregon for sleeping by the side of a highway. When the police computer revealed an outstanding warrant for bad checks in Missouri, he was extradited. When he got there, he admitted making the anonymous call. 
McCormick said that Copeland met him in a homeless shelter and hired him to work on his farm. After he moved into Copeland's house, Copeland opened a bank account for him so he could buy cattle. It seemed like a square deal, but McCormick grew suspicious when he found a closet full of men's clothes that belonged to other men from the shelter. Some had their names written inside, a common practice among drifters. During the 15 days he lived at the farm, McCormick said he made several cattle purchases for Ray and Faye Copeland. Faye kept the books, but soon McCormick overdrew the bank account and the Sullivan County Sheriff issued a warrant for his arrest. Right after that, on August 10, 1989, McCormick claimed that Copeland tried to kill him with a 22 rifle. Then, for some reason, Copeland changed his mind. McCormick fled the county. It sounded like a wild story, but the sheriff couldn't dismiss it out of hand. Then came the wildest accusation of all. McCormick said he found a human skull and leg bone on Copeland's farm. When he suggested that what might be happening here is that Mr. Copeland may be killing people, we thought we'd better look into it. Based on what McCormick told authorities, and coupled with the fact that two of the cattle thieves were seen with Ray Copeland, the sheriff had enough to arrest Ray and his wife, Faye, for charges relating to check fraud. A search warrant was issued to determine if they were up to something far worse. A drifter named Jack McCormick accused Ray and Faye Copeland of murder. He said the evidence was buried on their farm. On October 9, 1989, the couple was taken into custody. With the Copelands behind bars at the Livingston County Jail, the officers searched the farmhouse. They found items that seemed to substantiate Jack McCormick's account. Once you go ahead and bag this rifle. First was the closet of men's clothes. They had been cutting them up to make a quilt. Some of the clothes had the names of the missing men in them, just as McCormick had described. The officers also found a list of men's names hidden in a camera case. It included the men who had passed bad checks. The ones who vanished had X's beside them. If McCormick was telling the truth and Copeland was a killer, Sheriff Calvert would have to find the bodies. But after a week of searching, the officers found no trace of the missing men. While the Copeland farm was being searched, TV stations began reporting on the case. Rancher Keith Albright saw the story and called the sheriff to report what he knew. Yeah, this is Mr. Albright out here on Alaskan Road. Albright had rented a farm just six miles from Copeland's. Ray had done some odd jobs for him. Albright told police that he had found some bones out in the field. At the time, he thought they were animal bones. Now, he wasn't so sure. Having found no bodies on Copeland's farm, police believed that Albright might be onto something. If Copeland were guilty, he wouldn't be careless enough to bury all his victims on his own land. They spread out to search Albright's farm. In the barn, they noticed that some areas of the dirt floor had been disturbed. They began to dig. 
By the end of the day, officers uncovered three bodies from shallow graves on Albright's property. Calls kept pouring into the sheriff's department, and they tracked down every promising lead. When people found out that we were suspicious of what he may have been doing, they became suspicious about everything that they had seen him doing. So we, got, we, we went on a lot of wild goose chases. All right, it looks like we have something down here. Don't quite know what it when is. When the bodies started turning up, right, Copeland, perhaps trying to minimize his involvement, began telling wild stories. He said he overheard some strangers talking about dumping a body down a neighbor's well. Sure enough, investigators found the body of one of the missing drifters. But the lie backfired. The discovery implicated Copeland even further. The search on that farm intensified and a fifth victim was excavated from beneath 2,000 bales of hay. Using dental records, the five men were positively identified a few weeks later. Among them was Dennis Murphy, pulled from his watery grave. It was a good start, but investigators needed forensic evidence to tie Copeland more directly to the murdered men. Calvert gathered the 22 rifle found in Copeland's house and a pile of 22 slugs recovered from the bodies and delivered them to the Missouri State Highway Patrol. The rifle was test fired in their crime lab. It would leave its unique set of markings on the slugs as they hurled down the barrel. A comparison microscope was used to compare the markings. On one side, the test-fired slug. On the other, a slug pulled from one of the five murder victims. The marks on the slugs lined up exactly. To firearms and ballistics expert Todd Garrison, that meant only one thing. After comparison and examinations, we could conclusively say this particular bullet had been fired from this particular Marlin firearm obtained from the Copeland farm. Bullets from the same rifle killed each of the five victims. But investigators still needed to know if Faye Copeland had any role in this. The note found in the Copeland's house told volumes. Ray, who was illiterate, couldn't have written the names on the list. To see if she was the author, Calvert turned the list over to Missouri State Highway Patrol's handwriting section. Though a person's handwriting varies, certain features remain consistent. Handwriting expert Don Locke compared the note against a known sample of Faye's handwriting. He noted several distinctive characteristics. For example, the letter B always appeared in uppercase, even in the middle of a word. Locke concluded that this and other details were common to the note and to examples of Faye's handwriting. But what about the X's? It was possible that Faye had simply written the list of names and Ray had placed the X's by them as he killed the men. That would be harder to judge. Could one simply look at the X's and positively identify those X's to someone? No. But they were there, and as I said, they were consistent with the writing that was positively identified. Locke even compared the ink used to write the names against the ink used to write the X's. His conclusion? The same ink had been used for both. Faye Copeland wrote the names and marked the X's as her husband killed the men one by one. Locke and Garrison provided the forensic evidence to charge the Copelands with five counts of first-degree murder. On November 12, 1990, Faye was sentenced to death. Ray followed her on May 22, 1991. For two years, 
Fay and Ray Copeland were the only couple on death row sentenced for the same crime. Ray Copeland cheated the executioner when he died in October 1993 at the Potosi Correctional Center. In 1999, his wife of over 50 years had her sentence reduced to life. Though neither of the Copelands ever confessed, investigators pieced together this scenario. Ray somehow came up with the idea of hiring drifters to write the checks for him. Make sure that gate is locked. Yeah, the gate, the gate, got the gate. Come on. After the men outlived their usefulness, or when the warrants for passing bad checks piled up, there you go. Copeland murdered them. And Faye kept the books. How much is a human life worth? Police estimated that the Copelands made $30,000 from their scheme. $6,000 a victim. They thought no one would notice a few missing drifters. They were wrong. It's often said that two heads are better than one. When committing murder, having a partner gives police twice as much evidence to gather and twice as much chance to catch the killers.